All this is Dr. Mobeen Sayed from drbean.com. Welcome to one more show. Today I wanted to talk about the U- UK's mix and match of the vaccine. And um, I think that there is a lot of incorrect information about their decision that is out there. And I wanted to make sure that we, number one, understand what they have said and how journalists kind of sensationalized it. And number two, actually look at the science of it, that if the vaccines are mixed and matched, what will happen? So let's start with that. Uh, I'm going to share my screen and we would go, first of all, to the, this is called UK's uh, Green Book for the COVID-19 management. So this chapter is about the vaccination. And I really loved the way it is written. I have read the papers from Pfizer and from Moderna, which were submitted to FDA. Compared to that, this this document is much more comprehensive and exhaustive. And I think that is the reason that they got in trouble as well, that they had taken care of almost every scenario when vaccinating. And journalists, and I'm making air quotes for sure, journalists picked that up and kind of added a little twist to it. And then, of course, it became a news. So let's look at what they said. And then we'll look at what the um, actual, uh, what the journalists did. So I also wanted to show you this little cartoon here, which I made. So mixing and matching COVID vaccines. So here is, let's say, Pfizer and Moderna or AstraZeneca. And here is us. So would it just go boom is that the problem so we are going to look at that and here is drbean.com the references that you would see today are number one this is the original new york times report on that green books content and i think this is a report which started the issue so i have that over here we'll go through that in a second then this is a few guardians articles This is our CDC and their stance on it. And then this is the BBC talking about British Medical Journal asking New York Times to correct their stance. So with this, let's go through this. So this is a green book and they have discussed a lot of things. I just picked up some highlights. This table here is very interesting. This is about the UK population and various uh, categories. For example, total population 56 million and then males 27 and females 28 million and so on. So uh, again, not relevant to the discussion today, but interesting for you to know that it is in there. They have talked about children. They have talked about pregnant women and neonates. And so here, COVID-19 vaccines. Most vaccine candidates, candidates focus on immunization with the spike protein. I think that this sentence is the hero sentence for our discussion today. Because most vaccines do make the spike protein. So keep this in mind, please, because I would use this sentence in the sciencey stuff that we would discuss today. Here they are saying that we have two vaccines approved. One is Pfizer's BioNTech, and the second one is AstraZeneca. Then they describe those vaccines that the BioNTech vaccine is a messenger RNA-based vaccine, while the AstraZeneca is a replication-deficient chimpanzee adenovirus. And again, they are very upfront about it, that this is made in HIK-293 cells and so on. We have done these talks exhaustively. Just want you to kind of have that idea here. Then vaccine effectiveness, that is fine. Uh, We have gone through every vaccine's efficacy separately in whole talks. Storage, we have talked about it. Presentation, we have talked about it. Here is the dosing and the two dose or mix and match thing. And and see for yourself that does it really uh, look odd to you? So they're saying dosing and schedule. The dose for Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine is 30 microgram contained in 0.3 milliliter of diluted vaccine. After dilution, each vaccine can be given in this way. And the minimum distance uh, between the doses is 21 days. AstraZeneca dose, 0.5 milliliter, minimum days apart, 28. Then here, operationally, it is recommended 
that the second dose of both vaccines should be routinely scheduled between four and 12 weeks after the first dose. So this we had done a discussion separately that this part of the decision is sort of not that great. But uh, we, we have talked separately. We can talk separately again. I want to stay focused on the mix and match part of the discussion. But I thought it was interesting that it is written in here. So you can hear their rationale. rationale. This will, uh, for example, they say this will allow more people to benefit from the protection provided from the first dose during the rollout phase. Longer term protection will then be provided by the second dose. Here, I actually disagree with them. I think there is a play on words here. When they say longer term protection and then at attach that to the second dose outcome, that is wrong. The second dose's outcome is actually to boost the immune system as well and increase the efficacy from 60-70% to 90-92%, which they say is not a big deal, so no worries. However, saying that the longer term and then not saying that efficacy improves, I think is a wordplay here. So they could be a little more clear, but they clearly have a bias to increase the distance between the doses. So they chose the words that, that suited them the best. This is true that the long term with the second dose will become uh, boosted, but that is not the only part of it. Then they say if an interval longer than the recommended interval is left between doses. So let's say somebody gets a dose today and then the recommended interval is, let's say, three months and somebody reappears or comes back in six months, the second dose should still be given, preferably using the same vaccine. So now think about it for a second. Preferably, preferably using the same vaccine as was given for the first dose, if possible. So it is possible that somebody goes to a center, gets the first dose, and then appears after six months, and they don't have that vaccine anymore. Now what do we do? So this should be a rarity. This should not be a normal thing. But still, they are looking at that scenario and saying, okay, if the first do second dose with the first one is available, give that, administer that. But if it does, it is not available, then you still give the second dose from a different vaccine. That is what their point of view is. It is not that they have said, you know what, just give AstraZeneca the first time and give Pfizer the second time and you're fine. They're not saying that. They're very clear here preferably using the same vaccine as was given for the first dose if possible. Then they talk about the administration. And there are some interesting things that I've highlighted here. This is important. Somebody had been asking me this comment, that uh, this question, that what would happen to folks with the bleeding disorders? So here they say individuals with bleeding disorders may be vaccinated intramuscularly if, in the opinion of a doctor familiar with the individual's bleeding risk, vaccine or similar, or similar small volume intramuscular injection can be administered with reasonable safety. So somebody had been asking me about the G6PD as well. So basic problem with the folks who have bleeding tendency is that when the injection is given, they might start bleeding in that area and a hematoma may form. So they're saying that, well, if that individual is known by the doctor who may have given them injections in the past and know that the hematoma does not form, or a blood um, spilled blood in that area is, does not form, then it's OK, give the vaccine. Then they say that those individuals who are taking blood thinners, same thing applies to them as well. So maybe before the blood thinner, do this, take this medicine, and so on. So they have given some ideas here. <clears throat> then if I continue on, this is the category of the folks who would get the vaccine in various um, phases. And finally here, and one more thing that has been a common question here, and that is, can immunosuppressants or immunosuppressed folks get the vaccine? And they say, yes, they should. Now, this is what is the meat of it. This is what became the news, I think, a little bit 
It's the word choices. I would show you those, but let's check this out. <clears throat> and this part here in my description, I had said, how did this all start? So there was a Public Health England's COVID green book that we're looking at. Then new, new, uh, what was this? This one, the New York Times, I just wrote New Times. The New York Times published a piece criticizing them. And then the whole hell broke loose. So <clears throat> I said, let's dig in. And then we look at the science stuff as well. So we are digging in here. Look at this. If the course is interrupted or delayed, if the course of injection, it should be resumed using the same vaccine, but the first dose should not be repeated. So for example, if somebody got the first dose today, and let's say the first dose is half and the second dose is full. Somebody got the half dose of AstraZeneca today. They went away for six months. They came back after six months. They're saying now do not start again from the first dose. Don't give them another half, give them the full dose, give them the second dose. So that is the first thing here. There is no evidence on the interchangeability of the COVID-19 vaccines, although studies are underway. So they're very clear. There is no evidence. There are studies being done. So they say it up front. Therefore, every effort should be made to determine which vaccine the individual received and to complete with the same vaccine. So can we really blame them for mixing and matching and call them stupid that they are i'll show you some comments from professors saying they are they have abundant science and they do not know what they're doing and so on i think they're very clear over here then they say for individuals who started the schedule and who attend for vaccination at a site where the same vaccine is not available or if the first product received is unknown so it is possible that i show up at your clinic and I say, I had the first dose three months ago. I am here to get my second dose. And you say, do you know which dose did you get? Which, uh, which vaccine did you get? And I say, I don't know. So then they are saying, don't turn me away. Don't say we cannot give you another dose. Give me something. Give me another dose, second dose. It is reasonable to off offer one dose of the locally available product to complete the schedule. And I would explain the science behind that. But if you see here, they are very, very clear that don't mix and match them. But in this rare instance, when people have forgotten or they show up somewhere else, or they come back after so many months that the previous vaccine is not available, then give them the second dose anyways for whatever vaccine is available. This option is preferred if the individual is likely to be at immediate high risk or is considered unlikely to attend again. So if you turn them away and say, okay, you know what? You had Pfizer before. We only have AstraZeneca at this time. Please come back after a month and we'll give you Pfizer. And you feel that the person would not come back. Then give them AstraZeneca, protect them. In these circumstances, as both the vaccines are based on the spike protein. So this is very important. And I'm going to go over this science -y stuff. The both, both the vaccines are spike protein. It is likely that the second dose will help to boost the response to the first dose for this reason. Until additional information becomes available, further doses would not then be required. This is what they're saying. Now let's look at how um, this all was interpreted for us. So New York Times said, Britain opens door to mix and match vaccinations, worrying experts. Although I went over this article and they have actually put the right statements in there, which shows that this is an exception. Even then the word choices were such that the reader ends up in a negative state of mind right from the beginning. For example, Britain opens door to mix and match vaccinations, worrying experts. Although the second sentence here, if a second dose of one vaccination isn't available, another may be substituted according to the guidelines. This is a correct sentence. But the very first sentence has put the people in a negative mindset. Then down here, if you see 
Amid a sputtering vaccine rollout and fears of a new potentially more transmissible variant of the corona. So the fear mongering here that, oh man, the sky is falling. Britain has quietly updated, quietly updated. So once again, the word choice here, they have quietly updated its vaccination playbook to allow for mix and match vaccine regime. We just looked at the playbook. They are allowing it in a very specific situation. I would do the same in that situation. If a second dose of the vaccine a patient originally received, so now once again, the correct sentence is there, isn't available, or if the manufacturer of the first shot isn't known, another vaccine may be substituted, health officials said. So this is correct, but the beginning of the sentence and the word in there quietly updated already kind of discounts the second sentence. And then if you go down here, look at this. Some scientists say Britain is gambling with its new guidelines. guidance. There are no data on this idea whatsoever. That is correct. Said John Moore, a vaccine expert at Cornell University, officials in Britain seem to have, look at this now, seem to have abandoned science completely now and are just trying to guess their way out of a mess. So the thing is this, <clears throat> as much as I'm not a big fan of British's, Britain's management of the COVID, neither am I a big fan of US's management of the COVID, but at the same time, it also does not look right to twist it so much that a common person who would not go to the green book and read it word by word to understand what was really said, these folks are actually translating it for us and it is not right for them to create this kind of a uh, um, state of mind. So this is what they did. And they keep going in this way. Then came the England health officials. This is the guardians. So now the health officials from UK are on, on the spot. So they are now defending saying, we didn't do this, but this again, Professor, Professor John Moore from Cornell University has said, there are no data on this and whatsoever, fine. Then here is one more. Once again, John Moore from Cornell University. Then they added, so this is the Guardian. The US Center for Disease Control and Prevention has said that authorized COVID-19 vaccines are not interchangeable. Britain is also saying the same thing. They're also saying they're not interchangeable, but they're saying when you do not know the vaccine or when you do not have the vaccine, then at least protect a person, especially if they're vulnerable with the second dose of another vaccine. And here is the uh, CDC. Either of the currently authorized mRNA COVID-19 vaccines can be used when indicated. So used individually. ACIP does not state product preference. However, these mRNA COVID-19 vaccines are not interchangeable. Fine, that, that is fine. The safety and efficacy of a mixed product series have not yet been evalu evaluated. Fine, that is correct as well. However, if two doses of different mRNA COVID-19 vaccine products are inadvertently administered, no additional doses of either product are recommended at this time. So if I was given Pfizer, for example, then in my next um, um, visit, I was inadvertently, mistakenly given Moderna, then don't try to give me another Pfizer or another Moderna. Fine, this is not a bad guideline either. Co-administration with other vaccines, so flu vaccine and this vaccine, so they, they always say that keep distance between those vaccines, do not put them together because we will not know which vaccine caused what, plus we would not understand how the immune system responded correctly or not. So that is fine too. Then came BBC article that said, coronavirus BMJ urges New York time to correct vaccine mixing article. So here, Fiona Goodley pointed out in her letter so to the New York Times, she said, the New York Times headline claiming UK guidelines say such substitution may happen was misleading. And then she says, Dr. Mary Ramsey says, Public Health England's head of immunization said, we do not recommend mixing the COVID-19 vaccines. If your first dose is the Pfizer vaccine, you should not be given AstraZeneca vaccine for your second dose and vice versa. Dr. Ramsey added that on the extremely rare occasions where the same vaccine is unavailable or it is not known which jab the patient received, it is better to give a second dose of another vaccine than not at all. 
very very interesting way of journalists i thought that journalists used to dig in go deeper find the facts and bring in those and present them but it looks like i was mistaken so now this is the digging in part and finally the sciencey stuff what will happen if two of them are mixed so let's see here let's say this is the first visit and the person is given either pfizer biontech or moderna or astrazeneca pfizer biontech or, or moderna are both lipid particle based and they are carrying the messenger rna for the spike protein astrazeneca has an adenovirus in it which is carrying the dna for the spike protein when this vaccine is given so please uh, keep an eye on how the vaccine is going to do uh, the function when the lipid particle gets into the cell the messenger rna comes out of the lipid particle then that messenger rna is picked up by ribosomes which would make the spike protein and i had done a detailed discussion yesterday that that spike protein will be thrasher threshed or broken up by the endosome and then it would be loaded on msc1 or msc2 and then presented on the cell surface so here it is presented and then what happens is that the immune system will become active because of that presentation and the immune system will become ready so that's one imagine if it is astrazeneca's adenovirus when that virus is injected it is a replication deficient virus that means it cannot replicate it is just going to pick up the dna go have that dna go into the nucleus over there that enzymes in the nucleus are going to convert that into rna that rna is going to come out and the remaining process is the same it would go to the ribosome ribosome will make the spike protein spike protein will be picked up by the endosome it would be broken down into smaller pieces those will be loaded on msc1 or msc2 and these will be presented on the cell so once they are presented on the cell immune system cell for example helper cell or cytotoxic t cell they will become primed and the immune system will become ready <clears throat> when the immune system will become ready part of that readiness is to make memory b cells memory cytotoxic t cells memory helper cells meaning memory adaptive arm cells i am keeping it um short because we have done these discussions in detail how the immune system cells will work now imagine that this is the second dose and now imagine that this time the previous time the person got pfizer and this time the person got moderna fine it is another lipid nanoparticle it will be injected and the messenger rna would come out it would get into the ribosome ribosome will make spike protein spike protein will be presented on the system and this time immune system is ready i'll show you next slide in a second astrazeneca for example let's say i was given moderna first then i'm given astrazeneca second now astrazeneca would have the adenovirus that would go the nucleus the dna would go in the nucleus nucleus would convert that into the messenger rna messenger rna will become logged into the uh, ribosome and ribosome will once again make proteins spike protein that would be picked up by endosome broken down loaded on msc1 or msc2 presented on the cell surface and now this time immune system's response is a little different because it is already primed it already has these sleeping memory cells those cells are going to become really angry that this thing came in again now imagine if it was moderna or pfizer or astrazeneca at the end of the day for immune system it is this spike protein so these cells are now going to become ready within 24 hours previously when the first dose was given they took 14 days to 21 days or a month to become ready but this time they are ready they are sleeping they are waiting so they immediately within 24 hour become ready and they start making more uh, antibodies they'll make more cells of their kind that is proliferation they will increase in number the cytotoxic t cell would increase in number the helper t cells would increase in number so immune system is now boosted it is now even better and they would say well we are ready so does it matter which vaccine was given first and which was given second not really what will matter is the following let's say somebody has allergies to pfizer or moderna because of polyethylene glycol in their product so this person opted for astrazeneca now the next time when he goes in and there is no astrazeneca you can't give him moderna or pfizer because he has allergies 
or somebody who has an ethical and a moral uh, response to AstraZeneca and says, I don't want to have a vaccine that was built in the cloned cells, fetal tissue cells. So I would rather have Moderna or Pfizer. So you gave them Moderna or Pfizer the first time. The next time they come in and you say, you know what, ta-da, I don't have any more vaccine. I am going to give you AstraZeneca. So they may have to object on that. So there can be such reasons. Then thirdly, this data is not available. We actually do not know what will happen in the trials, what will happen when you mix and match them. So because there is no data, just like UK took a decision of delaying the second dose for Pfizer-BioNTech, that is an incorrect decision because the data is not there. From a science point of view, it can make sense. But from a data point of view, it does not. Similarly, here there is no data of mixing and matching. And that is why it is it may not be right to do. But the exceptions are there. So now let's say when the immune system is ready and the actual virus comes in, then, of course, our immune system is already active. It's going to pick up its hammer and thrash this guy within 24 hours and protect us. It didn't matter that the first first vaccine was Pfizer or Moderna or, or AstraZeneca because the immune system was still shown the spike protein. With all of these, there can be another problem. And that problem is, let's say, and now I'm just speculating. I do not have the right answer to this one. Let's say this is the genetic material for um, SARS-CoV-2. And here, let's say this is the piece for spike protein. We have talked about this many, many times, amino acid number X to Y. And this, this part of the genetic material is picked up to be added to the vaccine. It is possible that one company has picked up this much of the part, another company has picked up this part, another company, yet another company, has picked up this part. So if they have not all picked up the same size of the genetic material to produce the same exact spike protein, then it is possible that some antibodies may be different. But that difference also is not going to be a very large difference. So from a technical point of view, giving one vaccine that produces spike protein, then giving another that produces spike protein for immune system, it doesn't matter. The dose will matter. The component of the vaccine will matter. The data absence will matter. The, um, the allergic reactions will matter. The ethical moral questions will matter, and so on. But from a scientific point of view, it will not matter that which uh, vaccine was given first or the second, because they both are working with, all of them are working with spike protein. So this is the discussion I wanted to do. So, <laughs> so uh, I just saw a comment from Dr. Drake Romari, Ramore, the pretty. Oh, there was a comment here. <laughs> so, somebody liked the diagrams. <clears throat> so Glenda says. Dr. B, please discuss the role of polyethylene glycol in possible cause of allergic response in the vaccine. So that is the cause of the allergic response. And the polyethylene glycol is part of the lipid nanoparticle in both Moderna and Pfizer. So they're saying that somebody who is allergic to this substance should not take these vaccines. So John, I read about this. Um, I have to actually see the mechanism that what happened, and I would report back. Uh, Arun says, how adenovirus nucleic acid is enforced to go inside the nucleus? What about co-vaccin? So number one, co-vaccin, I do not know what is their exact structure. I'll do some research. Number two, the DNA, when we inject that into the cell, that DNA is carried, brought into the nucleus. And then inside the nucleus, there are enzymes that would open up that DNA and read or make messenger RNA from it, which will then get out of the nucleus. So if I can just very quickly draw that, what happens is 
and again don't take that as if it goes in the new dna goes in the nucleus then somehow it's going to go change the nucleus it will not so let's say this is a nucleus the inner circle here right just like we cool beans are an inner circle so we are a nucleus so here is a nucleus and brought in a dna let me make it this way Now this DNA in the cytoplasm cannot work because there is nothing in the cytoplasm that can translate a DNA. So DNA will be hauled. And William Days has been asking that what are the functions of the neuropores and if ivermectin can um, disrupt them. Uh, William, uh, the neuropores or the channel in the nucleus, imagine that the nucleus is a big ball with the brain in it and there are lots of gates on the ball which allow various things to come in and go out. For example, steroid hormones enter the DNA through those pores and do their function. For example, other hormones that are DNA-based hormones, that would do that function. There are so many signaling molecules in the cytoplasm that when they get a specific signal, they rush to the DNA and tell it that, hey, there is this message. For example, the cells have a cytoskeleton in them just like our buildings have skeleton correct the the structure the basic foundational structure so cells have a cytoskeleton in them and if you shear a cell if you kind of stretch and squish a cell then there are going to be signals created by the cytoskeleton that signal will then be translated into the nucleus or brought into the nucleus and that would tell the nucleus that something is happening with the cell so either try to make the cell strong or die because the cell is under stress. Similarly, as we know that SARS-CoV-2 sends these stress signals in. So now, uh, William, you had asked this question that will ivermectin cause so much of a distress that the normal functioning arrival of messages in the nucleus will not work correctly. Ivermectin just works on the alpha and beta importines. There are hundreds of kinds of importines and signals that can go in. Ivermectin is just working on one type, alpha and beta importines. And when it reduces them, the cell will make more. However, in that process, the nucleus, the, the SARS-CoV-2 doesn't get a chance to go into the cell or send its cargo in the cell with as much abundance as it could in a cell which doesn't have ivermectin. So not a big deal. And that is what we are seeing when we administer ivermectin. We do not see the person having their cells shut down. They actually work fine. It's just the viral part, importing A and B are blocked for virus. And of course, if there is anything else that is using importing A and B, that would be blocked too. But so many thousands of other proteins are going in and bringing signals in and working. And so we are fine. Now, back here to this basic question, which Arun had asked. So this DNA piece will be then hauled in to the nucleus. In the nucleus, now we have specialized enzymes that specialize in opening up the DNA. This is just like, you know, you bring the uh, ships that are old to shipyard where you break them. Similar is the situation here. The DNA is brought into the nucleus because the nucleus has the workers that know how to transcribe mRNA from here. So once the nucleus is in here, the DNA is in here, then that DNA will be opened up. So let's say this is the, this is the genes opened. And now there are various polymerases and helicases and other enzymes that are going to make messenger RNA from it. That messenger RNA will then be through those nuclear pores, it will be sent out. This messenger RNA will then work with cytoplasm ribosome and do its function. So I hope that answers your question, Arun. Cool. So uh, that is the discussion for today. I hope you liked it. As much as I'm not a fan of these authorities that are not doing the right thing, for example, for me, the right thing is to give ivermectin. LA is in in severe stress. They have told their, their um, ambulance people, EMT staff, to assess the people before picking up 
to see if they are going to survive or not. And if they're not going to survive, don't bring them in the hospital. Let them die. They have asked EMTs to use less oxygen in the in the um, ambulances. How sad and how frustrating. Why don't you allow the ivermectin? Ivermectin is not going to cause this wholesale issue that we have at this time. This is the kind of thing that frustrates me. So I have no respect for these authorities. But at the same time, I also cannot figure out why journalists just, just pick it up and misinform us with twisted words and create panic and anxiety. So I think in this specific case, uh, UK's health uh, department is actually correct. And these guys were uh, not. Yeah, and Barbara, that is the sad part that we have to have this responsibility for EMTs to decide who may survive and who may not survive, and then decide not to pick them up. This is sad. Ivermectin is the answer. And I have been giving Ivermectin to my patients for a long time. I have not seen any side effects more harmful. I have not seen any side effects, period. But side effects more har harmful than death? So when um, they are asked to give less oxygen or use less oxygen because there is less oxygen available, I could never imagine that. I was thinking of this happening in other countries. And I heard about it and I felt sad about it that they didn't have resources to do this. And here in our own country, which should be the most resourceful country, this is what's happening. And I think this is lack of the leadership's decision making, whatever is the reason that they are this way. It is economic, it is um, uh, political, it is their lack of understanding and education, whatever it is. Eventually, people are paying the price. When these big guys, big wigs, they go in the hospital, the second day they come out. And when we go in the hospitals, we have no idea what would happen. And now we are not even allowed to go into the hospitals because hospitals are filled. It, there is a problem on us as well. Going out, not social distancing, not wearing masks. That is a problem on our end. But at the same time, there are cheap, simple solutions available with data behind them. And we are not doing it. Anyways, I think I can keep ranting for a long time. Um, so thank you very much for watching. Uh, please like, subscribe, and share. There is a link in the description if you wanted to buy me coffees. And there is also another link in the description if you wanted to support my work. So thank you very much for today. And we will continue tomorrow.